Hi, DDF. I'm Maya Dralis. I'm the director of Poor Yellow Rednecks at Manhattan Theater Club. And I have sort of longish brownish black hair and I'm wearing a, a, a denim jumpsuit and a yellow jacket and happy to be here. Uh, I'm Kui Gwen. I am the playwright, uh, May's favorite headache. Uh, I am an Asian guy, uh, male identifying. Uh, I have a uh, uh, grayish, blackish hair. I guess uh, salt and pepper, as I would say. A uh, few extra pounds because I got sad recently and uh, ate too much. <laughs> and I'm wearing a East Main Dairy Diner shirt, which is my mom's diner. Uh, that's about it. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> this is super awkward already. <laughs> Let's give it a try. I know. I also realized. Oh, okay. Never mind. Okay. Yeah, they want us to ask, answer. I want to ask you a question, Majorellis. This okay. is what's going to happen. This is a nice official. Like this is what happens when I interview folks. So you've collaborated on multiple shows. That's you and me on shows like Bit Gone, Poor Yellow Rednecks, both at Manhattan Theater Club. Can you tell us how we met and how we started working together? Well, our first collaboration started in two thousand nine. Is that correct? And it was, uh, we had two very different roles. I was the director for a different playwright, Tom Bradshaw's The Bereaved, and uh, Kui was the appointed fight director. And I thought we got along like gangbusters. <laughs> <laughs> and I have no idea why Kui ghosted me afterwards. <laughs> I guess now I take it. So, but I meet May Dralis, our, our dear friend Chad Beckham, uh, hired me because I I choreographed multiple shows for for Partial Comfort was a theater company, uh, and he was like, "Hey, there's a wonderful director, wonderful play. You'll love working with her," and uh, brought me on. And I was introduced for, to uh, May Dralis from Yale. Uh, she would like to tell me right away because she was a fresh graduate from. Uh, Yale Drama School, uh, and I was, you know, a, a, you know, I maybe had a chip on my shoulders being a downtown artist. I was like, oh, cool, this is already starting out wonderfully. And then I commenced to start choreographing, and she kind of lingered right about here, and then continued to give me instructions for every step of the way. And I remember directly afterwards uh, telling Chad, uh, one, I hate her. Two, I'm never going to work with her ever again. Uh, and, and, and three, uh, if you ever call me to work with her, I will defriend you too. Uh, and I, I think and, that and just to, okay. Okay. Oh, yes. Oh, no, okay. I, well, owned it. I, owned it. I, yeah. I was over controlling. I had a lot to prove myself. I had, uh, if, if I had known that I had consciously introduced myself as May from Yale, I would have hated me too. <laughs> <laughs> And so we disliked each other for, or I disliked her, I guess, is, to be all fairness. She was not aware that I had, had made a bold proclamation that I would never work with Major Alice ever again. But, uh, but yeah, I think it was another, what, seven years before we ended up uh, to, together on, on a project. Uh, but that would be my child off screen, uh, you know, completely ignoring instruction I gave him earlier because I have a lot of authority in my house. <laughs> uh, I forgot where I was at. What happened? Okay, so fast forward to uh, uh, NYU 2014. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I get a call from NYU saying, hey, we're really excited that, you know, we have this opportunity to work with Kui Gwen on a devised theater piece with NYU. And I was like, yes, but I didn't realize that the weeks preceding it, this other thing happened that Queen uh, Mark Wing Davy, uh, <laughs> you know, the prequel to that moment, uh, Mark Wing Davy, who was running the program at the time, uh, invited me to create a device piece with the director. And they were very keen on uh, this up and coming director that everybody loved named Mayor Dralis. And remember, seven years prior, I was like, never again. <laughs> and I, I, I wanted to stick to that, that, that decree and said, uh, can it not be Mayor Dralis? Uh, I can suggest many other directors. Uh, and so I did. I made a list and weirdly, not a single one. And here's the thing. I never know for sure if they actually called any of these directors to see if they were available. But all they said to me after a week was like, we called them on. They were not available. Only May is available. <laughs> At the time, I was like, well, I, I need the dime. So, yeah, I guess we'll work together. And uh, and, and turns out we had both grown up a little bit. The stuff that we were, the chips on our shoulders had already fallen off. And uh, I think we just kind of became best friends after that. 
Yeah. Not to take away from your actual best friend, Chad, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we, get, we became very close. And then I think somewhere in the process of making that devised piece, I invited you. I was like, Hey, I got this, this, uh, this, this commission, uh, at South coast rep for a play. Would you like to come and direct it? What May did not know at the time was that play was not written at all. But, uh, but then I, I told her who to cast. I was like, Oh, we will need a, a person playing my dad and my mom, my grandma someone to play a boyfriend and then the multiplayer person and she cast it all not knowing that there was actually no script whatsoever <laughs> i do remember that we had a coffee because i of course had sent our actors on this wild scavenger hunt as part of my theater game extravaganza as part of this workshop and then we talked about your family um and you told me about this play so yeah Again, there was no play. I, I, I just knew the story of my family. Uh, in there. Uh, but 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 I can't believe that you 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 uh, didn't find me out <laughs> before the script show. Well, I found out pretty quick when I was in rehearsal. We were waiting for you to land because you'd taken a red eye. Yeah, yeah. Or something out to California or an early flight out, and I looked at my email and just before you got to rehearsal i got an email with the second act right because <laughs> i had written the second act on the plane well, this is you know, TF, our TF, TF audience doesn't know we're talking about bit gone this play it's that's gone. gone on to be produced everywhere and, and and done very very well for both of us uh yeah this is the the how it started it was just utter chaos uh mainly because of me but uh you know, because I, I'm hugely irresponsible. <laughs> and so I think that's how we balance each other out. You're yeah. No, I think that's actually I wrote this I, I don't know. I think everything that um you bring to a rehearsal process, which is like mischief and just curiosity and impulse, is brings out uh, a better side of me as a director. It, it allows me to be really free. So I feel like uh we make a really good team, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I think the my favorite thing about a process with you, and now I'm just skipping on to like our process. So we made this play in whenever it was and did really well. Uh, but you know, so but I think my favorite thing about working with you is literally the fact that I never actually have to deal with the psychology of the characters. <laughs> like, I write the characters. You you you're 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 really good at talking to actors and and, and digging all the emotional truths, making sure that that feels real. Um, how to balance all that. Which leads me to just, you know, make jokes. I just sit around and I'm just like, oh, what about this joke? Oh, what about this? This will be fun. What if we put a fight here? I get to just be able to, you just allow me to be as uh, mischievous as possible because you take on, uh, you know, a very maternal role to these actors. And, and I, I think that they they care about you greatly. And, and, and I don't know, we make a little family every time we make shows. And I, that's yeah. the thing that I adore working with you, you know, why I work with you. Poor Yellow Rednecks premiered in California in 2019 and was originally scheduled to run in Manhattan Theater Club in spring 2020. How did the show evolve during that pandemic-induced delay? The show really did change, and I think everyone's relationship and where they were in their life oh my gosh, yeah. really changed. Uh, when we did uh, Poor Yellow Rednecks in, at, at, in California, I was seven months pregnant. And to and I had not had a child yet. So now for me personally, coming back to Poor Y'all Rednecks when my daughter is really the same age as Little Man has been so eye-opening because I feel like I understand and can bring um, life to those scenes in a way that I didn't before I became a mom. And I just understand the psychology and the needs of the of Tong and Quang in a much deeper way than I think I knew the first time around. Um, and, you know, it's a huge play. There's so much that, uh, I mean, it's like, you know, it's Kui on steroids. It's like all the best hits <laughs> <laughs> into two acts. Um, and I think that I uh, was able to wrestle with those challenges. I needed the time in the pandemic to really figure out how we wanted to um, keep the play uh, spontaneous and surprising and impulsive and um, vibrant. Uh, even though it's discussed, you know, it, it deals with really, really heavy 
themes. And I think that in conversations that we had over the pandemic were really enlightening. I think every time we talked about the play, we just had more discoveries about how it should be structured, what it was missing, what are some of the things we learned from the prior production and how we were going to correct those, mis not mistakes, but how we we're going to learn from them and make it better. Yeah, for well, me- We're I, buoyant and joyous. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, I think the biggest it. thing that we did differently was you know, when, when the play was written back in what, 2018 produced in 2019, like, you know, like, you know, unlike, I always go like Vit Gone is like 85% my parents and 15% my imagination, right? Like I just kind of throw it in there. All the facts are theirs. It's very, very close to who they are. Poor Yella is kind of 50% them and 50% me. And, and it, it kind of deals with, uh, you know, you, when you see the show, it deals with a marriage on the brinks and, and I've gone through some stuff and, and, and I didn't, I didn't have the guts to ask my parents, what were the details of that? And so I kind of emotionally put the things that were happening with me into it. Uh, because of that, I think the 2019 production was a lot heavier. Because I was, it was still very close to those days in my life. It's been a decade since those days, and so watching it, reading it again, I realized it was pretty heavy. There was moment, though it was very, very funny. It was a little too heavy for me, and so I think the biggest thing that was changed was we we just made it. We just embraced the fact that it was a romantic comedy and just leaned onto that comedy side. That it's about, it's it's literally about, and it was always this case, but you really feel it now. It's about six people who desperately love each other, right? You know, you, you have a husband and wife that aren't getting along, but they desperately love each other. There's characters who want to be part of that, a grandmother who desperately loves her grandchild, uh, a, 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 a third will who's trying to get in with Tom, who also desperately loves her, a best friend relationship that, and it's just like this immense amount of love there. And it's like, oh, when you just kind of have six actors that love each other, with these six characters that love each other, uh, there, there's a lot of room to just have a lot of fun and a lot of play and a lot of a lot of trust amongst all these collaborators because uh, we're asking a lot of different things. It is, as May says, we went on steroids. It's like all these ideas I had with Vampire Cowboys and Vid Gone and now kind of even pumped up to uh, a, a new level of just absurdity. Uh, we have everything that you would expect in, in a show that has my name on it. There's martial arts, there's puppetry, there's multimedia, there's lots of jokes, uh, high comedy, but then there's like moments of attempted profundity, you know, <laughs> like I think there's moments where I, I try to talk about deeper th themes and meanings in there too, but always at the end of a joke. So it kind of sucker, you know, sucker punches you in the gut. So. Oh, this is Oh, Poor Yellow Rednecks is a sequel to Viet Gone, and both were inspired by your parents' lives. Are you still planning a five-play cycle, and have you and I started working on part three? <laughs> uh, is it? Okay, so it, it was the intention was a five-play cycle, for sure. It, you know, Viet Gone being the play that they got together, the second play, the evolution of them becoming uh, Americans, the third play, uh, bringing my my cousin who who I adopted, you know, our family adopted as my brother to America. The fourth play is really about like my grandmother, the end of my grandmother's life, but a reflection of who she was leading up to that. And then the fifth play uh, is the one that I dread writing because it's the one that takes events of the end of my parents as they're much older. Uh, and, and so with that, I, I kind of taken a, uh, since since we started Poor Yella, I kind of made a decision not to do four and five, uh, or I'm not going to do four and five anytime soon, because uh, I think that one, two, and three, which is kind of the origin stories of how the six members of my family became the six member of my family, kind of tells a complete story. Um, it starts with this, you know, in Vitgon, two people coming to America, and America is this foreign land. And in the third play, they are the people that are in America welping, welcoming someone to it and kind of going, um, this is home now. And like that we have a ongoing theme song that, you know, works in all three plays, uh, you know, home in the first play, I'll make it home is about whether you're going to go back or whether you're going to stay. The second one I'll make it home is really about this love story about what is home. Is it, is it me individual? Is it this country? Is this home? Is it, is it this trailer where we discover that it's each other? It's Quang and Tong 
calling each other home. And the third one is is using that same song once in a third rendition to finally welcome someone to it that has lost their home. And then they get to be that kind of pillar of help that uh, doesn't. So, so I guess that's the thing. Have we started working on it? Yes. I mean, I guess we've been talking about it. I have all these crazy ass ideas. Uh, some that I've shared with May, which uh, involves more music than even before. I think we might have to actually acknowledge that maybe, maybe, maybe what I'm making are musicals. I don't know. And then one that I, I talked to uh, David Valentine, uh, our puppet maker, about creating a stage size puppet. So, 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 so we'll see. We'll see. But uh, yeah, yeah. So, so that's 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 where where I'm at in my head when it comes to these plays. Poor Yellow Redneck is a raucous immigrant tale with rapping, cursing, and lots of sex. Have there been any particular memorable audience reactions? Well, when Quang are uh, played by Ben Levin and Poor Yellow Rednecks, uh, I guess first, and maybe he comes on, when he first comes onto stage, uh, a hush fell over the audience, and then someone very audibly yelled, not yelled, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> exclaimed yum <laughs> yes that is true i do think the difference between vit gone and now is i think because of vit gone people kind of know who we are now and because of that i think they're prepared for the language that i use in my writing where i think in vit gone there was a lot of like i can't believe how much he swears and everyone's like oh it's so lovely it's so great to hear your swear words again <laughs> i'm like oh that is a much different thing than when we when we started between then and now so, but the audience, we've we've been lucky that in the this you know week, week and a half of previews, we've had kind of a very vocal audience that has cheered for for things that that they want. Uh, they gasped at things that they were surprised by, um, and I'm being very vague because I don't want to spoil any of it because it, it's yeah. it's I think it's pretty fun soap opera writing there. <laughs> so I worked really hard for my soap opera. I want people to like. Lean well, in. I think I think you do such a good job of just setting up the world of the play that they're about to see. It makes it um, in both Viet Gon and Poor Yellow Rednecks, you set up through the playwright, you know, this is what you're going to see and this is how we're going to tell the story. And you set these amazing conventions about how you're going to portray the Vietnamese characters and the um, and uh, how you're going to portray portray them as protagonists and what the their the Americans are going to be portrayed by um sounding like how uh someone not from this country would hear under hear would hear them. And I think that convention is so unique and it's such great world building at the beginning. And I, I think it's really genius. And I think that's what people come for. They want to be transported to the to Quee's imagination. And I think that you forgive a lot of the F bombs even if you don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> or you don't approve because that's just part of the world that you're walking into and yeah. there's an exception. And, and I, I think the thing is like, though I swear a lot, and I think I've managed to not swear during this interview at all. Uh, I, I think I don't ever use it like the swearing is never used extremely violently, right? Or sexually. Like it's just part of the, because that that's how I grew up, right? Like I grew up, uh, you know, my parents grew up, you know, when they came to America, you know, we were learning English. They were learning, we were all learning English at the same time. And we grew up in a very blue collar world. And so we didn't, you know, it, it, when it's not your, or, you know, when it's not your language swear words, you don't know their swear words. You just hear everyone using it. And I'm just going to swear now, like growing up, I literally, and my parents literally thought the word fuck was a modifier for extremity. So Allah, that's big, that's bigger, that's fucking biggest. And so that's how I spoke. And that's how we all spoke uh, to the point where, you know, a major element of the play is, you know, my inability to learn English, right? Like I couldn't speak, speak good. And so my, 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 my teachers would constantly call my parents and go, Quee, Quee's language is awful. And they thought, it was, I couldn't speak English very well. What they were actually saying is, that little kid's swearing up a storm. You got to get him to stop. And so they would come home and they're like, Quee, are you fucking trying? I'm fucking trying, Dad. I'm fucking trying really fucking hard to fucking speak this fucking language. And it's like, well, fucking try harder because they fucking keep calling me because they say you're fucking not talking very fucking well. <laughs> and then about like, and it's, it's, it's sad because it took a couple of years. For, for, I remember the day that my mom came. I was like, hey, so... I have something to tell you guys. <laughs> like, what's that? 
t- turns out the word fuck is a really bad word. And of course we were all perplexed by it. It's like, what do you mean? How do you say, I, I love something so much. You're like, apparently that's what you say. You don't say, I fucking love that. You just say, I love that so much. Like that's way less colorful and fun. It's like, I know, but that's what they want you to do now. And so that's that, 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 that explains the origin story of how I speak the way I do, which I probably should have put in the play at some point, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> in the past you've both spoken about the power of representation on stage why is telling your own cultural story so important may or <laughs> this way i don't know which direction you are <laughs> um i i my i um sorry now i'm bumbling up but I just remember when I was coming of age, and if I had seen this story when I was um, younger, I think I would have had a very different road to where I am today. I think I would have started out with so much more confidence and belonging and um, attitude about like, hey, I belong here. Um, But I think because I never really saw myself represented in any story that I was seeing ever, you know, even in the, the books that I was reading and... Um, certainly not the plays. I, I, I grew up feeling that I was always outside of something. So the fact that we could give a gift to uh, my kid, to the kids you know that I teach now, because um, I teach at Fordham University now, um, something that they can look to to say yes, that with recognition that yes, that can be me. I can own this. Um, my, I can I can be proud of who I am. I can really take up more space. I think will be transformative, and I want I want um, others to have that experience because I I remember how I broke down in tears the first time I ever saw. It was in my twenties, like almost mid twenties, before I saw a show where it represented my family, and I just remember breaking down and also thinking. Gosh, everybody else around me has had this experience with theater this entire time, and this is my first time really having it. So we're giving it a gift early to folks. That's why it's important to me. Kui. Ah, uh, I, you're, you're so much smarter than me, so that's why I got through it to you because you always have like more elegant answers to myself. Uh, I, I think it always goes down to like the very core value that I have. Like, I it, it started with like theater company Vampire Cowboys, and the mission there was to make superheroes for or heroes uh, for those who don't often get to see themselves depicted that way, either on stage or screen. And so like for years and years, even before Vit Gone, I was making heroes that were female, queer, uh, and POC, uh, female characters that just had strength uh, that that allowed them to have. And, and when it came to Vampire Cowboys, they were, it was genre work. It wasn't, you know, you know, Vit Gone and, and Poor Yella have, have a little bit of more cultural depth, I would say, but those were just popcorn shows, right? Like, that, you know, a popcorn movie version. It was there just to be your favorite show. The thing that if it was a movie, you'd turn on uh, on a rainy day or you would go because you just needed a great time. Uh, because I think that there's something powerful in having a hero, hero that looks like you. And that, that that's carried on through Vit Gone, Poor Yella Rednecks, the, the work I did at Disney when I made Ryan the Last Dragon. It was a chance to go, hey, I think that there's something powerful when it's not just going for me hearing that, wow, that character on that stage looks like me. But it's that moment when that person that doesn't look like me, that the the I'll just say it, like the white person right beside me go, hey, I want to be like Raya. I want to be like Tong. I want to be like that Asian character that suddenly it, it means an extra level of importance to me, right? Because it's not just saying, hey, you're it, it's saying that there's something that looks like you, there's someone that looks like you that 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 has an ideal that that is an ideal that I want to be, you know, like and, and growing up. That was for me like Spider Man, right? Like, um, and which is an element in the show as well. That that thing where I I was saying like the reason why I love Spider Man so much was the fact that like I could put on the mask. It was the only character where I got to be Spider Man. Where I was like when I was Superman, I was like Asian Superman. When I was Batman, I was Asian Batman. When I was Captain America, Asian Captain America. But when I put on that mask, I got for a second to be just Spider Man. But here's the thing: I was always aware that Spider Man was Peter Parker, and Peter Parker's a white kid. And so for, the, for, for, for us, you know, when characters like Raya or Black Panther or Kong and Quang in this instance 
are able to to live in front of an audience that gets to cheer for them. There's something very powerful to be just in the room to see that when there's people that that it's not just to me, it's not just for the folks that look like me and May. It's for everyone, because I think uh, it's a fun show. It's a great show. But when you're kind of giving back with your laughs, your cheers, uh, your standing ovations is something a, a secondary gift that you're not aware of. It's not just for the actors. It's not for us as the artists. It's for the person sitting beside you that desperately need that validation to go, hey, you are part of this. You are part of the American fabric. You are a hero too. Uh, well, you both got your start off off Broadway. Kui, you had your own company, Vampire Cowboys. What do you miss about those early days and what don't you miss? Uh, for me, I, I, I think that Vampire Cowboys, I, I think no matter where I go, uh, I think New York will always be home. I think that Vampire Cowboys specifically is 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 my house, right? Like that is uh, where I learned to be the artist that I am. I, I cut my teeth doing it. Uh, I think that because I, I've always had a bit of a DIY ness to who I am. Like I, I I just I like having my hands on everything. I don't you know when when folks are like, oh that's marketing's issues. Like oh no, let me help with marketing. No that that that's set. It's like well let me help with that. Like I I need to have my hands in the nitty gritty. And uh, and when you have a partner as fucking smart as as Mayor Drowles, who has everything fucking covered, you find other things to do. Uh, and so I, I made a documentary this time because she was so busy, you know, making the show fucking awesome. Um, but uh, but what do I love about it? I love it because it was it's the one place where uh, no one can give me notes. I can just be truly me. And in a lot of ways, working with May, I feel like the same comes here too. I think that there's a lot of confidence going in. So whether you like it or not. This is me. It's like I, I always say that, like, if if I feel like when I look on that stage and it's something I love and it feels like a true representation of myself, I don't care if I get good reviews or bad reviews. What I do know is I'm telling the story, I'm expressing myself artistically to an audience and sharing something of my soul with them. And that means the world to me. And so 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 that is definitely Poor Yellow Rednecks. I could not be more proud of a show and a show that could not be more me. And I will say May too, uh, you know, uh, you know, on any stage I've ever been on. Um, the thing that I don't like about uh, my downtown is was the fact that I couldn't get paid. <laughs> you know, I, I, I the, the reason why I ran to to to, to LA was uh, I, I needed to take care of my kids and my wife and uh, well, mostly my kids. My wife can take care of herself; she's very capable. <laughs> but uh, but uh, but but you know, I, 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 I that that's what what brought me there. But um, but yeah, I'm, I'm always no matter where I go, no matter how big I get, uh, I'm always a downtown artist. May. Oh. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you ever feel like a downtown artist or coming from oh, here? You became oh. just like, you immediately was beloved, the beloved Mayor Drellis. You know, I, I still consider myself a downtown artist. I still feel like I just kind of go where the work is, no matter the scale. I mean, I, I, I still have done um, like tiny self DIY theater, like, um, just before the pandemic even. So I still feel like I go there. I just, for me, it's more important, just whatever story that I want to get behind and tell and throw my heart and soul in, I'll just do that no matter the scale. Um, so it does get easier when you don't have to do everything because I don't like to do the marketing and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I like it when um, uh, the doors sort of open up uh, uptown, but um, really it's just, I want to go where the, um, I don't know, where my, where my heart leads me in terms of what, what story I want to tell. So. If you could magically make one change in the nonprofit theater world, what would it be? I know not much about it, so I'm going to just throw this to you, May. You, you're way more educated in this world than I am. Um, one change. I guess the big fundamental thing is that I really feel that even despite all the problems that we're facing in the world right now, that if the U.S. government, federal government, actually gave just one, like, like 0.001% of their military budget to the arts and invested in arts and communities, it's still like a billion dollars <laughs> they could give to the arts. And I just feel like there has to be an investment on, uh, in, on 
you know, the, the United States of America, they have to invest in the creative expression of its people and that outlet. So yeah, make that change, make it supported by the government. <laughs> That's my yeah. pitch. <laughs> but with that, I just feel then you're giving access to audiences that maybe can't afford the ticket price. You're giving um, platforms for artists that, you know, that their stories need to be told and a platform for them. Yeah, I think the thing I do, I, I don't know if this is a nonprofit thing. Like, I'm, to, I'm just going to answer the question I wanted to answer, which is like, I think that what makes theater so important still uh, even the, you know, like, cause people are always like, why do you keep doing theater? Why, why theater? Why, you know, I think that the thing about theater is it's immediacy, right? You know, the access to be able to talk to your community directly, uh, you know, like, cause often like to make a big film, you, it, it's the, the, the thing that's required is this gigantic budget. And that budget kind of means you're getting a lot of corporate notes because they have to create a profit. And that kind of waters down maybe the message that you're trying to get to the folks. When you're doing theater, ideally, I think in nonprofit theater, you're 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 kind of investing in artists to kind of express themselves as authentically as possible for their audience and hopefully to their communities. And it, it should be a, it should be in a most ideal sense one that has immense amount of diversity, immense amount of accessibility, because that's what makes it special, right? And so. So, so I don't, again, I have no answer to nonprofitness, but I, I'll, I'll say that the thing that I love about doing nonprofit theater or doing theater, I don't want to put nonprofit in front of it, is is the fact that like May and I get to do this and, and get and celebrate it with the people in a room together. It's not something that we cut and then everyone goes away and then May and I work in a dark editing room and then we show it to a mass, mass amount of people that we'll never share, you know, be in the same space with. This, this is special because we're, we get to be a community together. Yeah. It reminded me when you were talking about home as the theme for each, there's just, I should tell you, you, you made that home. I feel like coming to these plays is like a home for me and so many actors. Yeah. Well, May, I love you. You know that like, as we started this interview process and I kind of was making fun of you, I, I will say that the journey from there to here, I think that you've made me a better artist, but I think you've also made me a better person. You know, I think that you 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 showed me how to be brave in a room and to be vulnerable about real shit. You know, because obviously I am very comfortable making lots and lots and lots of jokes and, and and poking fun at everything. But the thing that I love about working with you is you laugh with me just as much as any of our actors. You play as much as I do, but ultimately you're you're good at asking me those hard questions to get me to you know, get to the bottom of a truth. And I think that I don't know if I would have been able to make Vitgon or Poor Yellow Rednecks and eventually Vitgon 3 without you. Oh. What was oh. the show that made you want to go into a life of theater? <laughs> I want to cry. Now I want to hug you. I'm sorry. Now we lost the question. Oh, oh yeah. But it's, uh, I'm trying to turn on my light because I was losing it over here. Uh, what, what show uh, what made you want to do theater, man? Oh, what show made me want to do theater? I have so many. I don't I don't know off the top of my head right now. I'm trying yeah. to I know I usually have an answer, but I'm a little thrown because I was sort of emotionally moved by this previous thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, you know what? I, I, I should just go back to being mean and insincere. I'm sorry. Oh, no, uh, it, it means a lot. It just means a lot to me because I think you you've also made me a better artist and you've made me you made me bolder in the room you made me more like courageous and i i really this this project has meant so much to me because i just needed to feel like um i don't know part of this family again yeah no i i keep saying i feel like this last month has been absolutely transformative for me you know i think that i've had I've, I've been lucky. I'm not going to pretend like I haven't been in the last, you know, half a decade. I've been able to live out the dreams of an eight-year-old queen, making movies, work on TV shows, making shows in theaters, you know, that, that people see. But I, I think that I forgot how much I loved being in this room with you and with these actors in New York City, this place that literally 
has been my emotional home for so many years. I was there for 15 years. It defines me. No matter where I go, I'm, I'm still a New Yorker, right? And so I think that, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I feel both rejuvenated and transformed by this experience of making this show with you, with Maureen and Paco and Sammy and Ben and John Norman Schneider. And uh, I, I'm missing it. Fuck, I knew I was going to get some. John Hose. John Hose. Oh, no. and, and, and yeah, one of my closest collaborators of all time, John Hose. And I, and I know that, I don't know, I, again, like I, I've never been so proud of a thing. And at, and literally at this point, like I, 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 I just want it to succeed, not for me anymore. I, I just want it to succeed for all of you. You know, I want to see you guys get the shine that you deserve. You know, and, and because you've already given me the greatest reward, and that has been this last month of collaborating with each other. Oh, uh, and uh, I guess the piece of theater that uh, made me want to do theater uh, was um, there was an episode of Growing Pains where they did Our Town in it. <laughs> oh my gosh, really? Yeah, like Mike Seaver, who is like a total fuck up, weirdly ended up like was a good actor. And for some odd reason, I remember saying, it's not a piece of theater, I don't know our town that well at all. But all I thought was like, oh, if that fuck up character on TV can be good at something, well, this fuck up in real life maybe could go to theater and be good at it. And so maybe that, that that's what made me try my hand at theater, you know, when I was a kid. Wow, you owe your theater career to Kirk Cameron. <laughs> yeah, don't say that. Don't say that. That When you put it that way, that makes me, that makes me feel shame. And... <laughs> I mean, I mean, not that if you're, you're a fan of Kirk Hammer, that, that's <laughs> fine for you. You should come to our play. Either way, it doesn't matter. But, you know, <laughs> I'm not should, you. should they save us from ourselves? <laughs> we, we didn't <laughs> answer the question. The oh, best deal you've ever gotten at a TKTS booth, which celebrated its 50th anniversary, May. What's the best deal you ever had at TKTS? Uh, let's see. Um... Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know you why I'm having these mnemonic blind spots. There's so many. One, um, uh, long ago, my first, uh, uh, I got an internship. I was the assistant to the assistant director of Dance of the Vampires, directed by John Rando. And before my interview, I was preparing for the interview and I raced from my day job to TKTS to get tickets for Urinetown because I hadn't seen it yet on Broadway. And that was the director I was interviewing with. So oh. I raced through, I got, because of I, like around 7.50, um, I got the, the last two tickets, it seemed, to Urinetown. I got these amazing house seats. So I was grateful for the discount. And then also I did get that job, although it does go down as one of the most notorious <laughs> Shows ever to hit Broadway, <laughs> but thank you TKTS yeah. for helping uh, for helping me out. I don't know. I don't know about deals. I just know that my first year in New York, like you know, TKT the TKTS booth is like famous, right? Uh, and I remember like my my friend uh, Megan Ketch uh, and I. Uh, we were, it was our our first summer in New York, and so we spent all summer going to TKTS and going to multitude of shows, including David Al Alburn's Proof at Manhattan Theater Club, uh, and 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 I, I saw Top Dog Underdog, which is one that has yes. changed my absolute life. Right, like Susan Laurie Parks, a Top Dog Underdog, um, and and of course I, I saw Rent because you know I was a kid from the '90s. I needed to see Rent, but there was like a ton of shows. Like I'm like you, I, there, there's there's too many to name. Like there, it's it's an institution of the city at this point. Last question: What's your dream collaboration with the other person that you've never mentioned before? Huh? <laughs> your dream collaboration? Wait, where's your dream collaboration? Meaning not with me, with someone else that I'm going to be jealous about? <laughs> Who else do you want to work with? Me, but not me. Well, that's I think. Really jealous. Oh, I no, I don't know. Is a dream a collaboration with you that I haven't told you about. Um, I don't know if I told you, but I think poor yellow rednecks should go on to a much bigger, broader stage. I I I I, I you have never said that out loud to me, but <laughs> I secretly too believe that poor yellow rednecks deserves to be on a larger stage. 
You mean our secret dream collaboration is the same dream collaboration? <laughs> On yet a same bigger stage? This is, I don't know. This feels like kismet. <laughs> I feel like it feels like we there's are many people out there that can make this true. <laughs> <laughs> if only yes yeah it does it's kismet yeah but what, what, what it takes for, for that to happen is for all everyone that's watching this to come see the show come spell it out us. and make 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 it inevitable yes no, for but, do uh, it for the children do it for the children <laughs> <laughs> for the children wait my, oh, well our children do it for our, our children, children. Yes. our kids want to see me and <laughs> doing stuff on a bigger stage. stage come on come on you can do this dk uh, uh tdf you can do this <laughs> thank you thank you queen they keep saying thank you they want us to end may they want us to stop okay oh, you we are end. all right right